When it comes to approaching a patient with hypertension, the first and the foremost thing to do would be to measure the blood pressure accurately and get more than one reading. Then using the epilogical approach, the step number one is to make sure that we memorize all the differential diagnoses or probable diagnosis in the form of groups or chunks so we can recall them easily. Step number two is addressing urgent and emergent situations. So hypertensive urgency would be when the blood pressure is higher than 180 over 120. Hypertensive emergency is when there is end organ damage present. So in, the, uh, in this case, it would be hypertensive encephalopathy where the patient may experience headaches or altered mental status. Hypertensive uh, retinopathy where the patient may say they have bloody vision. Hypertensive pulmonary edema where the patient may have shortness of breath or chest pain. In hypertensive nephropathy, where we may see rapidly declining kidney function. The next would be steps would be weighing all the differential diagnoses and removing our anchor bias. So when it comes to weighing, we look at epidemiologically which diagnoses are much more prevalent in, in our uh, area. Well, all over the world, essential hypertension is a very high uh, primary cause of hypertension and 90% of the time the blood pressure is going to be high as a result of essential hypertension. So uh, when do we suspect that maybe essential hypertension is not present when the patient is younger than 35 or older than 55 at the onset of hypertension? In that group, we can start asking additional questions and even in the group which is supposed to have essential hypertension, we should still ask additional questions to remove our anchor bias. And what are some of the, those questions to address all the differential diagnoses? For sleep apnea, we can ask about snoring and we can look at the patient's weight. If they are overweight or obese, then they are at risk. We can also look at their face to make sure that there is no facial features present which may point to uh, sleep apnea. For renovascular causes of hypertension, we can start thinking about uh, questions uh, which may point to uh, differential diagnoses which are included in that group. Um, uh, which can cause hypertension. So we can ask the patient if they have a history of chronic kidney disease. We can ask the patient if they have headaches, which can point to fibromuscular hyperplasia. We can, for hyperaldosteronism, there may not be any uh, any symptom, but we can definitely look at if the patient's been taking medicine maybe and their blood pressure is very resistant. Then we can uh, suspect uh, hyperaldosteronism aldosteronism. Also, in African-American population, the prevalence of high aldosterone levels is, is very high, so we can suspect that diagnosis. For renal artery stenosis, there is almost no symptom or sign which the patient will tell you. So this is something we can just um, remember to think about when other causes have been uh, ruled out because it's not a very common cause of secondary hypertension. The next step or the next group of secondary causes of hypertension would be uh, endocrine causes. So in this, the most common ones are going to be thyroid abnormalities. So we can start asking about cold intolerance or heat intolerance, weight gain, weight loss, sleep disorders, appetite problems, constipation or diarrhea, and all those things that relate to metabolism and can make you suspect that maybe there is a thyroid abnormality present. The next endocrine problem would be Cushing syndrome. And oftentimes it's going to be a result of using steroids uh, as prescribed and we can look at the patient's medical history and ask them if they've been taking any medicine in the past which can make us think that maybe Cushing syndrome is present. Also patients features for example having a buffalo hump or a moon like face should make us suspect the secondary cause. The next would be hyperparathyroidism in which case uh, the symptoms that correlate to that diagnosis would be bone, bones, moan, stones and groans. So we can ask questions on those lines. And remember, we don't have to ask all those questions. We can just ask a couple of them. And if there is any suspicion, for example, if the patient says, yeah, I have a history of kidney stone and I keep getting them, we can actually think about this diagnosis. The next would be pheochromocytoma, which although is a very interesting diagnosis and very um, interesting secondary cause of hypertension is extremely uncommon. In my life, I've been able to diagnose only one patient with pheochromocytoma, although I tested quite a few for it. But anyway, if you diagnose one, that's still a win. So uh, this, these are the patients who will have episodes of high blood pressure followed by normal blood pressure. So if you suspect 
that such a, a pattern is present then you can definitely check also these patients are going to be anxious and nervous during those episodes and they should have tachycardia and sweating and all those things that are associated with high uh, uh, adrenaline levels so that is our endocrine chunk the next would be of course we are going to start thinking about drugs so there are medications and there are illicit drugs that can tip the patient over to hypertension so medications don't necessarily uh, cause hypertension by themselves so but if the patient is already at risk and they're hovering at the border of normal blood pressure versus hypertension they may tip over by taking some of the medicines so what are those meds uh, contraceptives and SAIDs illicit drugs for example cocaine stimulants so all those drugs are notorious we should definitely uh, review those medications and see if the patient is taking any the next would be pregnancy and hopefully this should be very easy for you to diagnose especially the second and the third trimester pregnancy which can cause pregnancy induced hypertension or preeclampsia and then eclampsia um, the last but not the least is white coat hypertension so we should always talk and uh, look at that and see if the patient is uh, hypertensive only in the office or they are also hypertensive outside of the office and if that is the case then we can uh, plan accordingly when it comes to uh, doing physical exam, then after reviewing the patient's history and after gathering all the data on the lines of secondary causes of secondary hypertension and making sure we are not missing any diagnosis and removing our, our anchor bias, we can uh, do a complete physical exam. Now, we should do the physical exam from the standpoint of whether the patient has not only a secondary cause of hypertension but also whether the patient is developing any complications of hypertension so therefore we should look at the cardiovascular system make sure there's no pulmonary edema there's no crackles there is no murmur there is no brewing and uh, there are no other stigma of uh, 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 secondary causes of hypertension or complications of hypertension after completing the physical exam we can start looking at the blood test and the imaging and additional testing to uh, rule in or rule out secondary causes of hypertension and also complications of hypertension. Again, we don't need to do all the labs and all the testing uh, when, uh, for all the patients with hypertension because that would be too much you, uh, uh, too much spending on uh, individual patients in it, and the cost benefit is not there. So we will do only those tests. For which we are strong for, for which we are strongly suspecting the diagnosis so for example if you hear a brewery only then you will do the renal artery angiogram if you uh, suspect that the blood pressure is in in, in the form of episodes uh, accompanied by a sweating and tachycardia and you are strongly suspecting pheochromocytoma only then we'll do the metanephrine levels in the serum or in the urine if you're suspecting there is moans, bones and groans present only then you will do a complete parathyroid hormone uh, level or, or, or panel um, thyroid panel on the other hand is quite common to do because thyroid abnormalities are very common about 10 percent of the population has hypo or hyperthyroidism so it's a good idea to check that anyway complete metabolic panel is extremely important because we want to make sure that the kidney function is not declining and the sodium and potassium are normal plus a uh, an elevated uh, an abnormal potassium level should make us suspect further suspect hyperaldosteronism finally uh, the echocardiogram is important to make sure that there is no hypertensive cardiomyopathy present so this is how we approach the patient after gathering all the information the history the physical exam and the lab and the testing and the imaging and fine and we arrive at the diagnosis I hope it was helpful. Thank you.